Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash frame rate. And by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker who needs stock video clips, photos, illustrations, music tracks, or sound effects, check out Pond5 for instant downloads at the best prices anywhere. Check out Pond5 at pond5.com. And for 25% off this month, use code TWIT25. This war on drugs has faced. Baltimore has been torn apart by drug-related violence. And now the violence is spreading. spreading. To the Players Theater this summer in The Wire, the musical. WMDs right here, right here. WMDs. Oh, my God. Michael Kenneth Williams reprises his role as Omar. Omar's coming. Omar's coming. Omar's coming. Omar's coming. Omar's coming. When Omar go a-hunting, all the slingers shout my name. They asked me, oh my, yo, oh, are you surviving this game? You got a whistle, babe, before the shoddy goes boom. Welcome to Frame Rate Episode 80. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, I'm Brian Brushwood, and that was Omar Epps. Uh, that was, uh, this is a funny or die thing, but they got a whole bunch of the cast of The Wire to do this musical thing. They had, they had the actual Kima. So had, that was really Omar. Oh, yeah, no, they had, they had Kima. They also had uh, Snoop. They had Bubbles in there. It's amazing. You got to go to Funny or Die and look up The Wire, the musical. <laughs> the I got to talk about somebody and get that pause. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That is that is brilliant. I definitely got to check the rest of that out. Yeah, uh, absolutely. How you been, Tom? I'm angry. I, I can tell. You're yeah. always angry. I had a horrible drive into work, but I'll get over it. But if, right. if I'm Good. extra angry today, uh, that's why. Okay. Well, so uh, is that the big story? That is not the big story. <laughs> <laughs> it is now. <laughs> this just in, the big story. Freaking HBO won't be offering a cable-free HBO Go option for now. Yeah, what's up with that? Them sitting on all their fat cat profits, sticking it to the little guy, not understanding what, that we want their content and may or may not want to pay for their distribution model that they base their businesses on. Jerks. Jerks. Uh, Jake Caputo launched a site called TakeMyMoneyHBO.com and let people type in how much they would pay for a version of HBO Go that did not require a cable subscription. HBO actually responded fairly good-naturedly, saying, love the love for HBO, keep it up. For now, Ryan Lawler at TechCrunch has it right. And Lawler wrote up a story saying, look, if people pay about $12 a month, for HBO Go, which seems to be based on the uh, an analysis of the tweets based on TakeMyMoneyHBO.com, what well, and, people and actually, would pay. That's, that's my favorite part about this story is that because people just put in a number that they'd be willing to play, pay, they were able to keep kind of this, run, this running total. And it's a statistically significant number that they're working with. The only problem is, is that there's a big gap between what people say they'll do for a service and what they would actually do, do for it. Uh, but the, the thing that impressed me was how much more this was than Netflix. And yet, think of the catalog of what you would get from HBO Go versus the catalog of what you get on Netflix. And of it's a testament to the power of the HBO brand and how much people really, really want this premium content. Uh, I, I, what, what I was going to say is uh, $12 a month, not enough for HBO, according oh, to Ryan Lawler. Uh, Ryan Lawler at TechCrunch says, you know what? If HBO gets so much free assistance... In marketing, in advertising, in in handling customer service for HBO, that the twelve dollars a month isn't enough. Isn't enough to but, make it up. And that's what HBO is basically saying. Yeah, Ryan Lawler's got it right. And think about it: HBO never advertises. 
they make advertisements that they play on HBO, and they right. have free advertisements. Those those commercials you see on the, on your cable system are almost entirely run by the cable company gratis, right. as part of their agreement with to carry HBO. HBO gets a bunch of free ads that run on the platform. They're not exactly free because they're part of the agreement. I mean, there's a value assigned to them, but HBO doesn't have to pay out cash for those right. in most cases. There may be exceptions out there, but that's what HBO is saying is, look, we would have to go market ourselves to people if we went straight to the Internet. It's just not worth it yet for now. Yeah. I mean, I, they do say for now. So, yeah, well, uh, and for now, of course, that's your wiggle room to do whatever you want later on down the road. But in the interview that uh, that uh, that they originally were quoting, he says he uses the numbers talking about 60,000, 70,000, 80,000 customer service agents working for cable com companies all over. And he says, what are they talking about? They're talking about HBO. And it's like HBO has a value and makes enough money that it can justify that level of workforce. It's, it's staggering. He also points out that just about every new cable subscription uh, and every transfer of cable from one, what you know, when people move from one area to another, they all get HBO for free for six months or whatever, and they almost never give it up. He says that it's just the numbers are just too big. And so uh, let me state unequivocally that I understand where they're coming from. And financially, maybe they're right in making the right decision. It's just that right now, given that this is the case, my hypocrisy meter is on its highest sensitivity rating for any kind of complaint from HBO crying about how pirated their content is. Uh, yeah, I, I, we, I don't, I mean, we'll talk about that a little later, but I, I don't hear HBO crying about how pirated their content is. They, they, right. they remain silent about that. It's the industry at large that does the crying for everyone. They've, they've, they've outsourced the crying to the MPAA. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Well, and it puts them in a position where, curiously, they, you know what, now that I think about it, they are curiously silent about it. You would think if you're the number one pirate at anything, you might have something to say about it. But if you're rolling in enough money, as appears the HBO is, to where they don't even want to consider direct subscriptions, then uh, then I think it's a smart move for them to not be loudly complaining about it. What they're, what they're saying is, uh, we are stuck in an old business model that it would not behoove us in the short term financially to change off of this is this is classic this is a all classic think, situation all i can think of is uh darth vader talking to luke skywalker in that little tube inside uh return of the jedi saying it's too late for me you know like like he understands like come on yeah, hbo is not doomed you. hbo isn't doomed what they're saying is we're not ready to make that jump yet it doesn't make yeah. financial sense and so all the conditions have to be right for hbo to make the jump and then we'll then we'll see if they have the boldness and bravery to make that jump. I think oh, that they could actually charge HBO Go Direct at a very high premium as a test. I, if they were going to be really bold, that's what they should do, is say, look, we will allow HBO Go Direct for free for $100 a month. No, see, I, I disagree with that because the whole reason they don't is because they Not don't want free, to disrupt yeah. their current model and if they offer it, whether they offer it at $12 and get a, a million subscribers or at $100 and get 12 subscribers, either way, they're still crossing a line that is disrupting their market. No, it doesn't so disrupt their market. It disrupts the cable company's market. Right, correct. And correct. so what, I think what you're, you've nailed it is they don't want to threaten that relationship. They're basically hidebound to the DirecTVs and Comcasts of the world, uh, not to experiment by offering HBO Go, Go Direct. In fact, it's kind of crazy that they have even allowed HBO Go to provide their stuff on the internet at all, rather than forcing you to have to go through your cable company to get it on demand. So progress right. has been made, but progress is slow when an old business model is threatened. We've seen this over well, and over again. I, I think it's one of those compromises you could tell where they're like, okay, look, we're gonna do HBO Go. This is where things are moving, but we will require every single person to have a the cable subscription. And so you can sell it as a value add on your platform. So, it, yeah, I mean, I, I think they're handling it financially right. I think we're all just a little bit frustrated because there's what we want and then there's what makes sense for them to offer us. Yeah, well, it, it's a failure of the marketplace. What we want doesn't make financial sense for the two big players yet. And so we have to go through this process again, as we have with music and with books uh, and, and with all kinds of things. Newspapers are you know, like making a total hash out of this transition uh, of, of waiting for everyone to adapt to the market conditions. That's why the fact that in that Twitter post, the HBO uh, representative says for now is actually quite heartening. At least they're admitting 
that a change is going to come. And I think the change is inevitable. Absolutely. A uh, uh, change might be coming from Intel. That's yet another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. Reuters reporting that Intel is promising programmers some facial recognition tech that would make it easier for networks and advertisers to see exactly who's watching their stuff. No more estimating from Nielsen whether your ad is targeted to the right place. You could make sure that that ad is delivered not only at the right time on the right program, but to exactly the kind of person who is who you want to see it. I I don't even know. My brain just shut down with with simultaneous thinking of the opportunities and what this would mean for content providers when all of a sudden you can vastly increase the value of ad dollars coming in to provide the content. Because obviously, if they know who they're targeting and when they're targeting and when they're in the room and what they're watching, all of a sudden you could charge a massive, massive premium, which brings us better content. And then there's the other part of me that is abjectly horrified where something ripped straight out of 1984 has been put right in our living rooms. Uh, I, I, you know, and it's actually it's not fair because 1984 was, of course, you know, the government imposed. This would very likely be some kind of opt in thing where it wouldn't actually watch what you're doing, but instead maybe come up with a digital signature to recognize your face. And all it would know is Brian's in the room. Brian's not in the room. Brian's watching. He's not watching. That kind of thing. Yeah, it would be total opt-in because you'd have to buy the hardware, and then you'd sure. have to turn it on, and then you'd have to say, this is who I am. This is my demographic data. And so when you see me, that's who's watching. Uh, and then there's, a, you know, you could have all kinds of conversations about spoofability, et cetera, et cetera. But what Intel's trying to say is, wouldn't it be awesome if you, as a programmer, could target your ads directly and not waste any money uh, and actually... You know, all of the privacy concerns aside for the moment, and there are huge privacy concerns, if the ads that you saw were all ads you were interested in right, and ads so that you wanted to see, you wouldn't hate ads as much. And everybody says, no, I hate ads. I'll always hate ads. I never want to see ads. But people go out and seek ads out. They watch them on the Internet without having to. During the Super Bowl, whole sites collect all the ads and everybody watches them and talks about them. People watch the Super Bowl when they hate football because they want to see the ads. People watch movie trailers all the time. They share movie trailers. They watch them over and over again. Those are advertisements. So what we consider to be an annoying ad is basically an ad that shouldn't is wasted on us, that we shouldn't see most of the time. Right. So think about it this way. What if you could trade? So take a, take a normal hour-long programming. You got, what, four or five commercial breaks from anywhere from a minute to two, two and a half, three minutes at a time. And so you buy this device and it says you can watch ads just as they normally are. You can skip past them just like you always do. Or go ahead and let us just tag your face. Let us know it's you automatically logged in. So essentially the second you log in and think about it, this is no difference. Dip, this would be no different than you providing a login and a password to, so it knows that you are now sitting here watching Hulu. It's that it's that kind of ability brought to traditional television. And then the, the deal is you get Hulu style ads, but they're highly targeted. So it's like no more two minutes of commercials to flash through. Instead, we're going to show you the first 15 seconds of an ad. You can opt to watch the rest of it, or you could just press the skip button and you're back to your show. And that's the way it's going to be for all your commercial break experiences from now on. If it was something like that, and every time you went to commercial break, it was an ad for a video game that I was really excited about. And I'm like, oh, I haven't seen this. Because think about think about how many video game trailers and opening cinematics and playthroughs for upcoming stuff that you seek out. And if all of a sudden that's the value-added content that comes to you, I, I think as creepy as having your face recognized every time you sit down in front of the TV is, I, I think I would actually opt in for that experience. I Here's the thing. I absolutely agree you agree with you about the ads. And like if it says, hey, you know, we know you like the band Sunvolt and the new album is out. And here's a few clips from it. I'd be like, that's awesome. That's exactly the kind of ad that I'm willing to, to sit through. I'm really creeped out by having a camera turned on and facially recognizing me and knowing everything I do. And I'm, not, you, I'm not I cannot say that I'd be willing to do this. OK, you realize you already do this. You, you, this is utter hypocrisy because you have a connect in your living room and that thing is always on. No, every it's, time not. You it's not in. always on. What, when the, w every time you use your Xbox, it's on. You don't reach over and unplug it. It's actually unplugged a lot. Yeah. What? Why? Because yeah, I'm a freak, Brian, because I Are don't want that thing on. Yes. 
No, see, I love it because it's like uh, uh, it turns. I mean, it's like, look, ugh, wow, this is I didn't expect you to be that kind of paranoid. That's that's impressive, actually. I respect. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm typical either, but because you're and, and, and so your point is well taken, which is a lot of people have cameras pointing at them already. Are you, are you one of those people like my mom who puts tape over the webcam of your laptop? Post, you don't it, like post a note sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Don't have one right now, but I'm in a studio surrounded by cameras, so <laughs> maybe it's an occupational hazard. I should probably seek therapy. Yeah. Let's move on to yet another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. There's really not much to say about this. Uh, Dish is saying, hey, our commercial skipping feature is necessary because of online TV. We need to compete. We need to make it just as easy to watch stuff on our network, on our boxes. And we're actually helping the cable industry. And, of course, uh, the industry is saying, no, we're actually going to sue you, Dish, because we don't think you can do this auto hop stuff without our permission. It's a copyright infringement. Uh, and, and and the beat goes on. What what I think makes it a little more interesting is that DirecTV has commercial skipping technology that they bought from Replay TV. We've had lots of people write in like, hey, what about Replay TV? They had this back in 2001. DirecTV owns that technology. Uh, and and uh, Mike White, CEO of DirecTV, told Reuters, we haven't chosen to use it. It's not clear to me there's a raging demand from consumers for it. I mean, what, skip commercials? <laughs> well, that's a convenient thing to believe, given their, their position. Uh, yeah, you know what? This reminds me a little bit of the justification that uh, you remember the old uh, uh, Secrets of Magic Exposed thing with the mas masked magician like back in the late 90s? I uh, vaguely remember that, yeah. One of the things he said is, said, look, uh, you, magicians, you're all annoyed that I'm teaching some secrets here, but this is going to make more magicians and it's going to force innovation and eventually it'll be good for magic. And magicians were like, you know, die in a fire. We send a, from hell's heart, we stab at thee. And so uh, it, it doesn't matter that eventually uh, the, the evidence bore out that magic is doing very, very well. Nobody got hurt in the long term, uh, although some magicians would, would agree with that on a, on a short term level. But uh, but this is what it reminds me of. It, and to be honest, these guys are right. People hate ads. They want to innovate and give the ability to decide. Now, think about it. You're not just skipping ads. You're deciding which ads you want to stop and watch. You're giving power to the consumer and you're giving them a better cable experience. Well, right with, now auto -hop, with auto hop, they're taking them out. So oh, you don't have a chance to see them. And that's what's really getting under the skin. Now, they wait a day before this feature can be implemented. Yeah, so they're just windowing. They're, yeah. they're adding, adding add dynamism to cable. So let's let's go with that angle, right? They're adding the ability to to have windowed experience so that they get a better experience. Because let's, let's face it, a day after when it's older content, the ads, they, they it matters when people watch the ads, right? So if it's, for example, it drives me nuts that on ancient episodes of Scam School, we, there are still sponsor reads for products that we're not getting paid on over at, at Revision 3 anymore. And, and they're advertising products and services that sometimes aren't even there anymore. And I would love it if, 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 if we could cut that out to give a better archived experience for people watching content that's been delayed. And that's what they're bringing to cable. And it is good for the cable industry, even though the cable industry doesn't want to hear that right now. This, this is a fight in the backyard when everybody's moving to the front yard, though. Uh, I, it's a horrible metaphor, I guess. But, no, but what no, I'm saying is they're basically saying like, hey, you know what? We need to make sure that we have the right to sell buggy whips this way. No, you can't. You can't sell buggy whips that way. And everybody's like, I'm buying a car. I don't need a buggy whip anymore. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. And that leads I us to yet another another big story. It's a fourth big story. Um the uh, new Comscore study comes out, says people who watch a network's video online spend 25% more time watching that network on their television sets. Well, of course, that makes sense because essentially the one experience builds up the brand in the mind of the consumer and then increases its use on, on another uh, related experience. That, wait, that wait, makes... wait, wait, Brian. So this makes sense that we should put our content online and make it as easy as people to, to for people to watch and follow because then they will like us more and use more of our product and possibly watch our ads and spend more money on what we offer them? Uh, look, I know it sounds like crazy talk, Tom, but it's just so crazy it just might work. <laughs> uh, yeah, the results uh, used a new method that examined how a single group of people consume video across 
TV, the Internet, and mobile devices. Uh, another result showed that TV networks on average are reaching more than a quarter of their total audience via mobile or Internet media, and 11% are digital-only consumers. Now, this is what I'm talking about whenever I say consumers always get what they want in the long run. Uh, they are out there using mobile platforms. And so all the companies that are saying, like, look, we need to restrict Google TV's box from allowing them to stream. We need to force them to come on to, you know, to watch us on, on the networks. We need to window things. HBO shouldn't offer direct. All of them are fighting a rear guard action because all the consumers are moving to mobile. And these studies like Comscore say, hey, look at this, 25%. Uh, I, I, yeah, are watching on mobile devices. 11% are digital-only consumers. And then all of a sudden, those same executives who are saying we need to force them to TV are like, wait a minute, all those eyeballs are on mobile? We need to make sure our content's on mobile. We need to be where those people are looking. Right, right. Well, exactly. It's it's one of those, uh, I can't decide which uh, mixed movie metaphor I want to go with. Either either if, if you build it, they will come, or nature finds a way. I think I'm going to go with nature finds a way. Like, consumers are going to get to what they want, no matter how many walls you build, we're like weeds. We're creeping through the cracks and people will do – people will accomplish consuming the media they want the way they want to do it. So you might as well figure out a way to make them happy with you while you do that. All right. Let's make our sponsor happy and at the same time make you happy because it's Audible and we're going to give you a free audiobook. Audible.com is a leading provider of audiobooks with more than 100,000 downloadable types uh, of fiction and nonfiction, pretty much all types of literature, 100,000 downloadable books. And for listeners of Frame Rate, Audible's given you a free audiobook to give you a chance to try this service. Uh, I don't know. What, what, what should we recommend? I mean, there's so many good books on here. I, did, did I tell you what I'm reading right now? Wild Cards? Do you know about this? No. What's Wild Cards? Tell me about it's Wild Cards. By, it's edited by George R. R. Martin. And in fact, he provides a couple of the short stories. And it starts off, it reminds me a little bit of Watchmen. There's an alien, it's a collection of short stories. I think this was released back in the 80s. And it's about a virus, alien virus transforms a bunch of people. Most people who get transformed are, uh, as they call them, jokers. Uh, they, you know, they, they have blue skin or their leg falls off or something. But every so often you get an ace, somebody who essentially has superhero powers. And in, in a very realistic setting, you know, it's not all putting on capes and fighting bad guys. There's some complicated stuff, and the government gets involved. And there's the uh, the the House Committee on Un-American Affairs starts trying to find out who the aces are and make them log themselves. In fact, some of the ideas you see later on in the X Men movies, uh, you see in these short stories. So uh, I'm enjoying it quite a bit. You can find Wild Cards One on Audible right now, absolutely free, if you go to audiblepodcast.com/slash frame rate. Uh, that or any other book. They have all the, 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 the George R. R. Martin books. They have all kinds of nonfiction books. They have the Andrew Keen books, if you're into that kind of thing. If you, if you Malcolm Gladwell's your thing, they've got that kind of stuff too. Fiction, nonfiction, Tagana by Sword and Laser. Uh, so go get a free audio a book. Try it out. Audiblepodcast.com slash frame rate. You'll be glad you did. And we thank them for their support of frame rate. Now let's take a dip into the slipstream. Lots of quick hits here in the uh, slipstream and, and in tube tops later on today. Uh, YouTube signed a music licensing deal with BMG and eight other publishers so that uh, they can make sure that they have more music videos available on YouTube, too. But also their content ID system uh, will flag uses of music and allow them and, and See, allow the companies to make money off them. This is huge. This is um, what the big thing that YouTube discovered is that it's just as fun to make big content as it is to consume content. However, to uh, copyright has legally crippled the ability to get creative. I mean, and 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 express yourself. Now, you know, somebody like a you know Sony Pictures is able to. They've got a team of lawyers, and somebody just uses whatever music they want, and some lawyers do their mojo, and then it shows up in the movie. And Quentin Tarantino takes an old song and makes it famous again. You can't do that legally. In, in YouTube without structures like these in place. And it's so important. It's like, I want to see more of these agreements built into the YouTube experience. I want to see more editing suites built into it. I want to see Foley software that works in the cloud. I want to see the, the high, in continuingly, increasingly high-end tools built into this platform so that we could get more uh, superior content across the board on that, on, on YouTube. Another uh, HBO Go venue has opened up. If you have the Kindle Fire, you'll be able to watch HBO Go on the Kindle Fire now. So the app, the app is available from the Amazon App Store for Kindle Fire specifically. Yeah. Course, as with all these HBO Go apps, 
you never know which platforms are authorizing which apps. That's the thing that bothers me the most. It's like DirecTV is like, oh, yeah, you can use HBO Go on the web. Oh, no, you can't use it on a Roku. Right. And you right. had this problem with Time Warner for a long time. Yeah, of course. Well, yeah, I don't want to get into it. But there is a, there is a letter that we'll uh, talk about in the feedback that has exactly this question. Disney has become the latest studio to force rental services to wait 28 days before buying films directly at a discount from Disney. Of course, Red Boxes and Blockbusters and Netflixes can all go and pay full price for the DVDs once they're out. Uh, but if they want to get that discounted rental price, they have to wait 28 days. So do you think that this is just the new standard and this is how it's going to be from now on? Again, rear guard action. Like, really? Oh, no really? One, so it, even even know, DVDs is old ahead. But I, anyway. I, yeah, I mean, DVDs is, is, is still viable and lots of people rent them. And I, I don't think it's it's a business that's that's close to dead yet. Uh, but really, why are you trying to to stop people from renting DVDs when the future is making your movies available and monetizable as many places as possible? That just right. doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, uh, fair enough. And uh, we've talked about this a couple times before, but uh, another story on Ars Technica about how there will be no more distri- distribution of movies on film by 2013 in the U.S., and IHSI Supply predicts studios will stop producing film for the rest of the world by 2015. See, I don't, I don't believe this. I'm sorry, it's IHS Screen Digest, not I suppose. Uh, I, I don't believe this. You can still get vinyl records made as a one-off, and there are people who choose to distribute for vinyl. Well, I think you're, the- no, I think you're, <laughs> you're misunderstanding. The, the studios are not going to distribute film to the movie theaters anymore. It doesn't mean that no yeah, movie okay, will be made on mean- film. It's the but- major studios are like, yeah, we're not going to send out canisters of celluloid anymore. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna digitally distribute in the United States. Uh, NIHS is saying, yeah, by 2013, that'll be it. No more 35 millimeter films being sent to theaters. But but I guess here's what I'm saying is is I I don't believe that because most albums you can it's for a very small niche market they continue to serve the vinyl market. There are photography stores that continue to serve the 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 analog printing market. I'm not sure know. that's a good analogy though. I mean, that's like saying DVDs won't go away because there'll be a niche market of people who still want DVDs and I think you got a good point there. But you're talking about the theater system and the and the and the movie studios saying we're just not going to spend the money to make 35 millimeter prints. You better upgrade y- your stuff and most of them have already. They're just not going to make the 35 millimeter print for distribution. I I don't know that that's the case. I mean, I understand for, for the vast majority, yes, but there will be art houses. There will be there are people who love the original film experience, and I suspect that there will, they will still be served. Well, and yeah, will... art houses are going to continue to have film projectors, and indie films may still be made on films in certain cases. But that's not what the story is. The story is basically the industry pushing the theaters to say, "Look, it's cheaper. We're just not going to print thirty-five millimeter film anymore." I, for I for believe- most stuff. I, you're, I, you're arguing that 35 millimeter film won't go away entirely, and I think that's true. But, right. But the point here is that the, the, the movie companies are going to stop making their major releases printed on 35 millimeter film. Right. I understand the story is what they're saying, but I'm calling them liars. I'm saying they're I saying something. I think you're crazy. Not- I think you're absolutely insane. Well, let's meet up in 10 years, and uh, you can owe me $5. Actually, 2013, so we only have to wait a year. All right. <laughs> uh, Netgear's Neo TV has added Wi-Di. Wi-Di is sort of that Intel-backed technology that allows you to do what Apple does with AirPlay. Uh, take something you're play- you-, you have available on your desktop or your laptop on your home network and have it play seamlessly on your television through a box like Neo TV. Uh, Neo TV is a competitor to Roku. It has Netflix, Hulu Plus, Vudu, YouTube, and Pandora, along with other stuff. Uh, basically, otherwise, the hardware remains unchanged. 300 megabits per second, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, optical out, and HDMI. Yeah. Another, yeah, just another adaption. Oh, and another one of these little dongles is out from Western Digital. WD, or no, this isn't the dongle. Western Digital's TV Live and TV Live Hub media players now include Voodoo. That's just notable. If you're looking at all these different set-top boxes and you're like, Voodoo's something I really like, well, now the D- Western Digital TV Live box uh, comes with voodoo. That's just worth noting. Uh, here's the dongle thing that I was talking about. Um, or di- oh, the smart, that's the smart key TV, right? Yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. Google TV set-top box will play movie streams from Android phones and tablets. I think I moved right into tube tops, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. I was, I was waiting for. Hey, let's play the tube tops thing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was just looking at my tabs. Uh, 
<laughs> I was trying. I was trying to figure out how to segue into that, but that was fantastic. That uh, it ended up being delightful the way it was. Thanks. Uh, so I totally botched the WDD TV story too. It has Sling Player built in. That's the big uh, thing, which means you can take it with you because it is portable. And if you have a sling box at home, you can plug it in in the remote location and it will access your sling box over that device. Or it's a great way to share a cable connection that you have in one room with another room by installing the WD TV in the other room and the sling box in the first room. That's awesome. That's way awesome. Yeah, that's, that, that's a, that makes that story make much more sense. Uh, okay, <laughs> Google TV set top box uh, uh, is going to play movie streams from Android phones and tablets. Again, another AirPlay like thing. So if you've yeah, got an Android like, tablet an or phone. What an innovation that AirPlay has turned out to be. That's that's how you know you've really killed it is when all the other services start looking to, to mimic the functionality of it. Because I've heard, uh, you know, I, I never bother to use AirPlay because I don't have my Apple TV connected. But I know that uh, Justin Robert Young loves his, uses it all the time. You know, this is just branding, though. Apple wasn't the first to do it. DLNA existed a long time before Apple AirPlay. It's just when Apple does something, everybody starts to call it that. And well, they, we're they, falling they, into they, that they trap. They, they, they figure out those those one to two syllable words that that are close enough to capturing the essence of what the thing is, and then we all, you know, fall yeah, in love. Yeah, like with iPad it. and iPod, they capture the essence. Well, okay, granted, it's just because no, it's it, Apple's it, hype machine and everybody uses it. It's a crutch. <laughs> wow. All right. <laughs> Told you I was angry. Yeah, boy, you are. It's certainly, it's certainly Tom today. Yeah, and I can't keep anything straight. Uh, yeah, I, I got a feeling that it's the beard talking. I feel like the beard <laughs> woke up on the wrong side of the face. Right. It's all over here. <laughs> uh, PayPal and TiVo partnering up so you can buy things with your PayPal account through your TV. Um, give users the ability to explore interactive ads and buy products directly through the interface. Oh, my God. Would you use this? Would you be into this? No, this is one of those things that sounds great. Like, oh, that's really interesting, and I would never actually use because I wouldn't trust it. Yeah, well, yeah, well, it's like you would, you would, you would get to that impulse buy. You would hover over the buy button, and then you would think, I'll just walk over to the computer and buy it right now. Y yeah, because I'm familiar with that. I understand how to do that. I remember being really freaked out uh, long before smartphones. I think this must have been 2003. Uh, Amazon added the, the ability to basically using text messages navigate through, then buy stuff. And I sat there, you know, hitting three 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 two 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 one one three three, and 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 typing in the name of a book. And it took like fifteen minutes. And at the end, I was like, I guess I did it right, you know, buy. And then uh, and the book showed up. But uh, that's what this reminds me of is something that uh, uh, is maybe a good idea, but is an interface that I would not have a pleasant shopping experience with. Yeah, we, we shouldn't damn it without trying it, obviously. Maybe they've cracked it and we'll be like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I'd totally use this. But it does seem without trying it that I'm suspicious and I wouldn't want to use it because I'd be afraid I'd buy too many things. Man, I got to tell you, I really love doing Tom and Brian's Skeptical Hour. <laughs> the cynic, cynic, Tom and Brian, cynics at large. <laughs> we just we have frown up a loser. We're like, mm, we'll see. Well, tell me what you think of this. Smart key TV HDMI dongle. This is the stupid dongle that I've been trying to talk about <laughs> for the past 15 minutes. Uh, it's just another one of these things. Uh, and, and Gadget has a great uh, lead in from James True, who's like, what do we call these? Is it screen top? USB PC? How about <laughs> Pendroid? Uh, but the smart key TV from Italian firm Liquid TV has a one gigahertz ARM Cortex A9 processor, uh, 512 megabytes of RAM, four gigabytes of flash storage, a USB port. And it's, again, one of those things you plug it into the HDMI port and you get TV. Stop. Yeah. Yeah. Another another step in the right direction. And it's it's so weird because I don't know how excited to get because you have to wait a while for the market to figure out, is this where we want to go or not? But, you know, as long as we continue to see innovation like this, I think we're moving in the right direction. All right. Let's take a quick break and uh, thank our other sponsor for today's show, Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. A lot of you folks are media makers out there, whether you've got a blog or a website or you make videos uh, or films or uh, podcasts. Pond5 has all kinds of royalty-free stock video, plus millions of high-quality photos, vector illustrations, music tracks, sound effects, motion graphic templates, and other creative assets, which can be downloaded instantly for legal use. So you don't have to worry, I'm going to get in trouble for this, uh, in any kind of media production, virtually any kind of media production. Uh, you can get big volcano smoke 
or city front skylines and a ferry shot coming past Liberty Island and turn all it all right, all into a movie five roulette right now. about how the <laughs> volcanoes are going to destroy Rome with <laughs> evil mutant penguins. And you can See, find I, sound I, effects I for the penguins. That. I'm working on my zombie romance movie. It oh, is that right? In ancient Rome. Uh, in fact, do we have any, go and type in there ancient Rome. I need some B-roll, something to kind of establish the scene for my zombie romance. Oh, so go to video. Yeah, those are those are stock vis, stock photos. You got some great stills there you can choose from. Uh, video footage. There's the Colosseum with the sky See? going Ooh, that over. That could be good. Yeah. Change the color of the sky to red. Yeah. There you go. That's good because it's all shot in zombie. And it's HD. Look at that. It's twi- It's nineteen twenty by ten eighty. <laughs> or as, as the chat room is calling it, Zomromcom. It's the new oh, look genre. at all the people rushing around trying oh, to get away, get away from, from the zombies. From the zombies. <laughs> and if you're somebody who's like, well, I shoot that stuff myself, you can sell your stuff on Pond5 and you get industry top ranks uh, rates. Set your own prices, uh, industry-leading royalties. Uh, it, it's, it's great for media makers of all kind. If you're a media maker working with video, images, sound, go right now. P-O-N-D, the number 5.com. Check it out. And, and... You get 25% off your purchase this month when you use this coupon code TWIT25. That's Pond5.com. Use that code TWIT25. And uh, we love Pond5. We th- and there's a freaking dancing zombie on Pond5. Everything you need is there. See, this is, this is the big the climactic ending when he learns how to dance. It's sort of a B, a B subplot that it's like he doesn't want to dance at his wedding, but then he learns, and then that's when he busts it out. It's sort of a feel-good movie. <laughs> Yeah, the Zom Romcom is is the fastest growing movie market in that it went from zero to one. I can't wait to now. see it. <laughs> Let's check film film, shall we? Uh, we we alluded to this earlier, but Game of Thrones, which ended its second season in the U.S. last week, uh, is the most pirated show of the spring, according to TorrentFreak.com. Yeah, uh, I kind of. How do you feel about this weird, like, Oscar nomination for piracy thing that they're doing now, where every so often they come up with this, and the nominees for most pirated television show is How I Met Your Mother? And, I don't. Uh, I don't look at it that way. I look at it as as sort of a, a, a stat ranking. Like, well, people are downloading stuff illegally, and we can all have a big long argument about what that means financially and whether it's hurting and how much it's hurting the industry. But it would be good to know. What are the things people are downloading? And here's the stats. I, I think that's kind of cool. I'll I mean, it's what. kind of cool like, as a stats nerd, I should say. Not cool that people are infringing. If they're really worried about it, you'll know You'll know that HBO is looking to bank on it when you start seeing, like, Pepsi integration with uh, with Game of Thrones so that, so that they can't avoid the ads. And no matter if they pirate it or watch it on HBO, they're making bank. <laughs> In the Game of Thrones, you, you get very thirsty. <laughs> and... You drink or you die. (laughs) Uh, Also, 500 full-length movies you can stream for free. Uh, Theverge.com reporting on this, but it's coming from uh, another source that uh, is called Open Something or Other. Um, Open Something or Other, yes. Do you have have the page open? Open Culture. Open Culture, culture, thank you. Uh, Now, here's the thing. The Verge points out, Chris Welch points out, not everything listed here is necessarily supposed to be free. Uh, Open Culture has just went and said, look, we found these at legitimate sources, legitimate websites. They're not going to shady websites necessarily, uh, but they are finding all kinds of free films, and they may have been uploaded to legitimate sources without permission. But most of these are actually public domain or freely available movies. Uh, and and there's 500. I don't know. Okay, you got you got 1984. You got Moulin Rouge. That's in there. a public domain movie. The, ni- the 1984 from the 40s. Oh, Which, is it from the 40s? I Which thought it was Moulin from Moulin Rouge. Is it? Oh, it is 1954. You know what? You're right. I saw these titles. I got excited. I didn't most think about of, it. most of these are are classic movies. 1930s through the 50s. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Uh, Monty Python's now for something completely different. That one's probably not uh, public domain. Well, it's it's something completely different. Um, I don't know. Yeah, that's a that's a. It might be licensed though. See, some of these are copyrighted, but they're available for free streaming, like on Hulu, where you don't have to sign up. You can just watch them for free. Sid and Nancy with Gary Oldman. Wow. Slacker, Richard Linklater's uh, classic. I don't Solaris know if they have any Hulu stuff in here or not. I haven't. I haven't run across any. 
I wonder if they have any of the YouTube stuff. I've noticed very recently I, there that was there's, stuff on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. There's a ton of full length movies like uh, War Games is there, and it's been there forever, oh. and it's the full movie. And you, if you go to check that out, you'll see a whole list of other ones. And I have to imagine they're clear, right? Because they've been there forever. Otherwise, YouTube would have removed them. Am I wrong? Yeah, or, sure. Well, uh, you would think so. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. All right, let's move on to check in on the NSFW show Frame Rate Summer Movie Draft. Madagascar outgrossed Prometheus, Brian. I did not see that coming. I did not see that coming. Although the price is... I not mean, it's terribly not shocked, t- frankly. Uh, Veronica paid $21 for Prometheus, and it made $51 million opening weekend. Madagascar I paid $18 for, and it made $60 million opening weekend. Uh, This is it, man. I got one movie left, Seeking a Friend for the End of the World, which I paid $2 for, and that's probably what it'll gross. And uh, from here on out, I just have to cross my fingers and hope I limp into respectable territory here because there's no chance I have a winning. I just don't want to be dead last, which, to be honest, I think Veronica's going to have because... She's already burned Cabin in the Woods, Prometheus. Her only movies are Abraham Lincoln, Born Legacy, and Sparkle. Born Legacy uh, could do very well, I have a feeling. Sparkle, I still think, is going to bring in some dollars because it's got Whitney Houston in it. And I think a lot of people are going to want to go see it. Let's be generous and say each of those movies takes in $150 million each. Uh, that still places her behind me right now. And, uh, yeah, and J- Sarah's not going to come in last, and Justin's not going to because he's only had one movie. He still has Brave, Ted, and the Amazing Spider-Man, uh, and the, the uh, Ice Age: Continental Drift. Yeah, the uh, Sarah and Justin both still have their movies to come. Like we're getting into their part of the summer. They waited until later in the in the draft to buy stuff. I only have two more movies: Total Recall. And Paranorman, but of course the Avengers is still keeping me in front of Scott Johnson by about guy, forty million. The guy, the guy at number one place says, "I only have two more movies, and they're giant blockbusters." One by uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Paranorman is not a giant blockbuster. Recall is mean, not a giant. It's a re- blockbuster, but not a giant blockbuster. Total Recall will will get over eighty million. Paranorman will get you over. You said 60. that about Prometheus too. Uh, well, yeah, it's definitely going to do over eighty million. Prometheus is uh, it made fifty million dollars opening weekend. You're telling me it's and not going to make horrible reviews. Yeah, well, so what? I think it's a stretch. I think it could make eighty million, but uh, I don't think it's a lock. And it's not definitely not the thing that's launching Veronica into contention, which is what you thought, oh, dude. I I will I will make a side bet. I'll make you a side stake bet that there's no doubt that it, within a month it'll be over eighty million. No doubt about it. Well, I'm not going to make that bet because I think it's quite possible, but I don't think it's a no doubter. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Uh, that's my boy and rock of ages uh, this week. Scott Johnson's last movie, that's my boy, and uh, Sarah Lane's first movie, Rock of Ages. Yeah, and uh, in the chat room, they're making fun of uh, that's my boy saying, uh, you know, oh, yeah, no, that'll make money because Adam Sandler sells sarcasm. Dude, as Adam Sandler makes bank. Did you see Jack and Jill? That was one of the ones from, I think, our winter movie draft. That It was a total turd, and it made like a bajillion D dollars. It's like you slap his name on it. It doesn't matter the quality. This He's is got the, Murphy syndrome. This is why I love the movie draft, because people get confused with what movies they like, what movies right. they consider good, and what movies make money. And that's Madagascar 3 making $60 million opening weekend, and Prometheus making $51 million is a classic sign of that. you got to steal at $18 with Madagascar 3 because it's going to have another big weekend because the yeah. families are all going to still go see it. Kids' yeah. movies always do better than people expect. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, let's move to what we're watching. What we're watching. I will uh, save most of our Prometheus discussion to the spoiler zone, but we did both see Prometheus, yes. and it is getting ripped apart by the critics. Yes, well, and and let me say this: I, I, uh, there, with, without being spoilery at all, let me just say it is gorgeous. The production levels are incredible. Uh, uh, Michael, is it Fast Fassbender? Fast, Fast, yeah, David, well, the guy who played David, Michael Fassbender. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, it's though there are things about this movie that will stick with you, and that may be some of the best executed ideas that I've seen in the last decade of science fiction cinema. Um, but there are problems, which we will discuss. How about that? Is that yes, fair enough? I think that's fair enough. Uh, overall, I, I liked the movie, but I wanted to like it a lot more than I did. 
Well, I'll tell you this much. I honestly don't think I watched the whole movie. There is no way. Uh, I felt like I saw half the movie. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you're not saying you fell asleep or something. You feel like a bunch was left on the cutting room floor. Well, and we know that. We know yeah. that like 20 or 30 minutes was cut from it. And well, I'm really. That's always true. In fact, yeah, they're, but, they're talking yeah, about. Uh, somebody on Twitter pointed me to a story. They're talking about putting out the Avengers director's cut in the theaters later this summer. I don't believe that. But that would be awesome, question mark? Because I don't they're know. like, we want to be the top grossing movie of all time. So we're going to put out the director's cut to push us over the top. I'm like, does that count? That's a different release. Uh, I, did they count special edition releases of Star Wars to the grand totals? I don't know. That's they a good question. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and you know what? If you're not going to count it because of that, then how can you count a 3D version of a movie the same as dip? But by, that's released by, at the same time. And it's the same content. A director's cut is, is more than just like, oh, we added 3D. The director's cut is, this is added footage. It's a different, right. and it's released at a different time. Try this on for size, right? Okay, so let's say uh, let's say the King's Speech comes out in March, makes some money, and then uh, Oscar season rolls around, they release King's Speech again, makes more money. So that's the same movie, two different releases, two different release right, windows. same right? movie, though. Separately, though, you got Avengers 3D and Avengers 2D released at the same time. Uh, and 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 that's the same movie because because they were released at the same time. What if you had Avengers 2D released and then six months later you had Avengers 3D released? If is that okay? And if that's it not is, okay. there, there's not a significant enough difference between the two releases. You haven't changed the content. You've changed the the. That's like saying, well, the the Technicolor version and the widescreen versions are different, and I, and I don't think that I don't think that makes enough of a difference. Okay, well, okay but but, but You're just, now we're just having a ridiculous argument. Well, no, no, no. I'm just saying it's it's a matter of degrees. It's like yeah, you I'm change the content. That's a different movie. You fundamentally digitally alter every frame of the movie. Frito shot make first. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's called that's the Godwin's law of this kind of argument. <laughs> yes, I'm just, absolutely. All right. Uh, the other things I'm watching, uh, Mad Men. I think had a brilliant season finale. I think it's. Probably at least the last four or five episodes, the best Mad Men episodes they've ever made. Uh, I, I truly, truly loved what they did at the end of this season. Uh, True Blood had its season premiere this week, uh, and they got off to a great start. I, I think it's, it's probably looking like one of their best series premieres, season premieres, uh, in a long time. But frankly, I'm not watching that much television right now. I did watch uh, a Eureka, an episode of Eureka, in their final season, and, and they're doing well, but I'm playing Diablo 3. I'm enjoying that story more than anything that's on television, and I think that is emblematic of why television ratings might be declining. Uh, that's interesting, well, because you got so many other options, and they're compelling story options that suck you in. I mean, the production values and the cinematics of Diablo 3 are as good as any movie out there. Oh, speaking of which, there was two stories I, I wish... Uh, can we just touch on these real quick? Because I totally didn't think to put them in the doc. Um, we do. You want to talk real quick about what happened with the oatmeal and what he's up to? With uh, because that's all copyright well, law and that do, stuff. You, so you don't care. There's nothing else you're watching. Uh, not not really. Okay. I mean, I I watched the despecialized uh, version of of Return of the Jedi, and of course, we're still in love with uh, with Cora. But I don't know that there's a whole lot to say about either of those. Um, all right. But, let's, uh, yeah. Before we get to feedback, let's let's get in the oatmeal thing. Yeah, so, so the oatmeal thing, basically, uh, the guy who did the oatmeal has had a ton of content that was posted, uploaded by other people to the site um, uh, funnyjunk.com. And uh, they had a dust up with, uh, with, with them legally where he said, take it down and essentially funny junk. This is all according to the oatmeal, so you don't know necessarily. And what's, what's the oatmeal again, just so people know? Uh, the Oatmeal is an online web comic where uh, you know he makes those really long. Yeah, keep it's not a video. It's 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 comics, and we've we've they, he's had some good commentary on on video and TV and stuff. Right. Yeah, we talked about his uh, his Game of Thrones piracy argument that he was making, uh, and uh, in this case, he he told Funny Junk to take the stuff down. They went back and forth, and apparently, uh, you know, he took his fight public saying, they're not taking the stuff down, this is BS. And so he took his argument to the court of public opinion and posted just a giant run of links of all the content that he created that Funny Junk was hosting and deriving ad revenues from. And uh, Funny Junk recently responded saying, this is defamation of character, this is you're willfully uh, causing us damages. What you need to do is take down any reference on your site to the, the, the website Funny Junk, and you need to pay us $20,000. And in true oatmeal fashion, he's again taking his response to the court of public opinion, posting the complaint, his response, and uh, set up a, a, the following challenge where he set up a Kickstarter. He says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise $20,000. 
I'm going to take a picture of it and and uh, send it to you along with this drawing I made of your mom seducing a bear. And then I'm going to give half the money to to cancer uh, benefit and the other half to uh, the World Wildlife Fund because this is stupid and this all needs to go away. And uh, last time I checked, it was up to like sixty thousand dollars of donations. It's one hundred twelve thousand now. Holy cow! This is now. Now here's the question I have for you, Tom. This is obviously great publicity for the oatmeal. Everyone loves what he's doing, but legally, the type of people who are going to sue someone for complaining about them the way Funny Junk is don't tend to be phased by this kind of stunt. And it seems like, if anything, if I'm funny junk, I would think that, oh, great, now I actually have a case for defamation of character because you're going out of your way on a targeted smear campaign to make my site look terrible. Well, yes, your principal is right that what Oatmeal is doing does nothing to defend them against a charge of defamation of character. Uh, yes. I don't know whether it makes it worse or not. It could possibly could. But, the, but defamation is really difficult to, to prove. And I don't yeah. think Funny Junk has any standing to bring a lawsuit. I would be extraordinarily surprised if they brought a lawsuit for defamation. Def you, have to, you have to really show, like, malice aforethought and, and say stuff that isn't true. There's, there's lots of standards uh, that I'm probably not even doing proper service to when you want to bring an actual defamation or libel uh, case so uh, funny junk's just blustering and i think oatmeal knows that i think that's why they're like treating this the way they are because they they realize that this is never actually going to go to court and since it's all just bluster anyway why not bluster right back that's interesting that's a good way to, to do it and i totally forgot about the other story because i didn't put it in the doc but uh uh yeah that's i guess that's it on stuff i'm watching all right let's check feedback now it's time for feedback with brian and tom on Meg Tim Mag, actually Tim Magnuson, uh, writes in and says, Our Dish Network contract is up in August. We're thinking of cutting our cord after 17 years with them and putting a Roku on one TV and an Apple TV on the other. My question is this. If we get a smart TV with the internet on it, could we, as an example, go to bravotv.com and watch Top Chef like we were using my MacBook, or would we have to do the app thing and attempt to stream it that way? Thanks for the show and the help. Uh, well, with the Roku and the Apple TV, you don't get a browser. So in, with neither one of those could you go to Apple t uh, bravotv.com. And I think he knows that. But there may be some smart TVs that have the Opera browser app. And I don't know whether those w are blocked or not. Usually websites will block any browser that's not a desktop browser. So Google TV, for instance, if you use the Google TV Chrome on the Google TV box to go to NBC.com, which owns Bravo, you won't be able to stream anything. My guess is probably not. There's probably not a smart TV that has a browser that isn't blocked. Although, now, do I'm not, I don't want to say that 100%, but it, it may, may be. Uh, so two questions. Number one, do you think this is a branding problem that they have with smart TVs? And I guess there are, uh, yeah, because we're seeing ads for smart TVs where they're doing web searches uh, by, you know, with the motion controls and that kind of thing. Uh, do you think that this is uh, a case of, the market brand confusion about what smart TVs can and can't do. Because if I'm an average consumer and I see people navigating the web using Google, then it's like, oh, this would be great. I can go to Hulu. I'm going to feel pretty gypped when I go there and it's like blocked. Do you see you smart TV ads that show navigating the web using Google? Yeah. Uh, well, there's uh, there's that one with iJustine that, uh, that Samsung one. Okay. Uh, so that one has a browser. Okay, yes, but my guess is is that my guess is that you won't be able to use that browser. It probably is a lockdown browser where you can't go and uh, and watch Hulu on it. I, or, I I wouldn't jump to that conclusion without knowing for sure. Yeah, well, I the mere fact that we're having this debate or this discussion and and none of us know, I think, is a testament to there needs to be a clarification or consumers need to know. I mean, if we host a show on this and we don't know the current I think, state. Well, I think the reason we don't know, I think the reason, well, definitely the reason I don't know is that that's not the way to do it. Uh, those apps are awful. The platforms suck and the navigation is clunky and, and really difficult to use. And you have much better options. Like if you have a MacBook, streaming that MacBook directly through, uh, you can get a little $20 dongle and, and actually send whatever's on the MacBook directly to your television uh, over, over the, uh, the dongle. You can, you can actually have it go straight in, and you get everything that's on your desktop. Uh, even better, in Mountain Lion, the OS that's coming out next month for 20 bucks, you can actually AirPlay 
wirelessly from your laptop through the television. Now, this I'm tailoring this solution to Tim because he says he has a MacBook and he says he's going to buy an Apple TV. Those solutions work for him. But that stuff we talked about earlier where Google TV is going to stream from Android tablets and, and phones, it could work that way, uh, especially if you can stream the, the Chrome browser off of those platforms. So there's lots of ways to get around this. I don't think a smart TV with the browser on it is your best solution anyway. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. That's that's the surly beard talk. You can also you can also buy uh, Top Chef on iTunes. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, that, that, that's a good point. Of and course, then you don't I, have to deal with commercials. So it's, I think a lot of people are obsessed with the idea of watching television for free. I think uh, even though the math works out to where it's better, a lot of times to just buy the episodes at two dollars a pop or three dollars a pop. I think we're so we, for for a lifetime, literal lifetimes, we've been trained to expect television to be free and have ads, and, and so I think hard for a lot of people to make that jump you can buy it amazon video on demand if you don't like it and that That's works true. on the roku so paul meyer blew my mind saying uh regarding the discussion about 4k on last week's show i wanted to point out that although many movie theater projectors are 4k capable they are only showing 2k content digital imax projectors are capable of showing 4k when a movie is recorded in that definition the sony 4k projectors that are used in the movie theater i work at are capable of playing 4k content but have never played anything but 2k movie theaters are only showing 2k that's 1998 by 1080 content which is only 1080p because that is the definition movies are usually recorded at or down converted to 4k movies like the dark knight in 2008 looked incredible in 4k at a digital imax but that was the only that was only some scenes and only about uh, 3.7k due to technological limitations of digital imax uh, and then he points off uh, the limitations of film uh, but this was shocking to me because i i I guess I never put it together. I've heard 2K, but I never thought about it in terms of uh, you're telling me that the projections I'm watching at the movie theater is essentially the same resolution of my computer. It's lower than my computer monitor that I'm looking at right now. That is shocking to me that uh, that that I didn't know that. Uh, well, th that's just a good rule of thumb is that just because technology is capable doesn't mean everyone's making the full use of it. So, yeah, I. I've started to, when I go to the movies, try to spot pixels. And you can usually easily see them in that, um, the MPAA green band. Yeah, before, yeah. If you look at the text, That's you can funny. see the pixels. And then once, uh, and it's one of those things that now that I see it, uh, but this is one of those things where, like, like I, I, this whole time I thought I was watching 4K and it was only HD 1080p. And uh, so so this just, if anything, just makes me more convinced that people aren't going to jump uh, to 4K televisions. Harish wrote in and pointed out that uh, when we were talking in the spoiler zone, and this part isn't spoilery, that the next season of Game of Thrones may be only half of the third book, that they would split that book into two seasons. Uh, he pointed out that in UK and Australia and a few other markets, book three was actually split into two books. It was marketed as two separate books because it was so long. Yeah, and uh, which uh, I, I don't know if that makes it okay. I don't know that any of us had a problem with it, but I guess... If you if you're a purist and you want to feel like there's a rhythm to everything, then latch on to that as as a being. Um, and I got uh, I guess we got one more. Uh, Blockman Bing says, uh, uh, you know what? Let me do this one. Um, actually, L W A T C D R writes it says my wife and i just listened to our first frame rate and we'll be adding it to our podcast list now as to websites and coming mvpds i do not think that you need to worry too much about the fcc deciding that porn tube is an m uh porn tube is a mvpd or even netflix and or hulu those sites are all video on demand sites if the fcc takes the narrow view of what makes up an MP mvpd and only state sites that broadcast streams aka show after uh show after show will count for instance, Twit could be an MVPD because you can show certain shows at X time as a broadcast. The fact that you can also offer them as a video on demand doesn't really matter in this case. So, uh, well, Todd, that's if, the point is we don't know how they would define an MPVD on the Internet. It could be defined as on demand video. It could. You're saying it shouldn't be. And I agree with you, but it could be. And it could be defined as content providers like Twit or it might not be. It, we just don't know. Yep. Uh, yeah, man, you want to you wanna wrap things up and move over to the spoiler zone? Yeah, uh, Blockman, since we mentioned Blockman being, he was just taking issue with us saying the big three. He, he had his own definition of what he thought the big three was, and he was grouping on-demand providers like Amazon and iTunes versus streaming providers like Netflix and Hulu. Uh, total, total good point. Uh, we were just throwing loosely around the 
term big three because we happen to be talking about it. We weren't trying to define an industry standard. So there's certainly the biggest three providers that we talk about on this show. And and it weirdly he lists uh, Hulu as an also ran, which I I don't believe that at all. Hulu is definitely a top three video provider for on demand legitimate content. All right, if you don't want to be spoiled by Prometheus, leave the room, pause, turn off your player. Do something to not be spoiled. There go. Look, our our guest is leaving right now. Sorry about that. Um, uh, Liz, do you want? Do you need to? You got your headphones on? Okay, you're good. Because uh, we're going to talk about Prometheus. But uh, for those of you who aren't hanging around for that, thanks for watching. You can find us on the web, twit.tv/fr. Don't forget, in July, July second, Frame Rate Live moves to Mondays at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. Until then, you can catch us on Tuesday morning at 9:30 a.m. Pacific. We'll see you later. I love that somebody uh, recently said, I'm going to watch that movie you spoil for me every time you do Spoiler Zone, Soylent Green. Yeah, I would do it, yeah. And I actually wondered uh, if it held up. I, if that person, I forget who it was that said it on Twitter, but but send us a review of what it was like knowing the big end to Soylent Green, because I bet it stands on its own. It's a gorgeous movie. I watched it again. Wait a minute. We had a long argument about whether knowing the ending improves or, or degrades your enjoyment of a movie, and you argued viciously that it degrades your enjoyment of the movie. Yeah, uh, yeah, but the question is whether or not it ruins the movie. And I'm going to say that that even knowing the end, because uh, I've watched the movie before, and therefore I knew the ending. And watching it again, I enjoyed it immensely the second time because so much of it really holds up. Uh, it, it, what it, now, granted, if you have the spoiler, then you don't get the punch at the end. You you are missing part of the experience. But that doesn't mean the other 80% is total crap all of a sudden. It's just a different experience, and it's you have an incomplete experience. So I want to know what it's like watching the movie 30 years after it was made. Uh, yeah, 30 years after it was made, and what and knowing the twist ending. You know, because, you know, for example, The Sixth Sense, if you had heard the ending of that movie, then you would have a different experience, but I would want to know if you had a good experience. We're about to improve your experience of Prometheus by spoiling it for you. <laughs> Uh, first of all, let's start with the good. Yes. We should probably finish with the good, but let's start with the good. Uh, absolutely gorgeous. Don't you agree? Cinematography was gotcha. insane. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I will say aesthetically, and this isn't necessarily bad, I was disappointed that they futurized so much stuff. For example, this scene you're seeing right here, uh, the problem is if this happens before Alien and you go through so much effort to tie it to the Alien world then how do you explain, and, and it's distracting and unnecessary to have so much gee whiz CG flying around, technology is so advanced in the future moments, when, when you know, if you watch them, quote unquote, in order, then all of a sudden alien, you got rudimentary 70s looking computers. How much more would you have enjoyed this if, if they kept more of that aesthetic and granted, you know, and, and had really crappy CRT monitors that they were using. Because I think that Not was Not a part wit. Of I would have absolutely hated that. Really? Absolutely. And I just watched Alien. None of that mattered one little bit. I've read this criticism a couple times, and I understand where it's coming from. It's a consistency issue. Like, I want it to be consistent. This was so pretty and so beautiful, I would have hated it. I would have been like, oh, you're pandering. You're trying to make it look like something so, it's not. Alien happened to be made in 1979. Don't, don't degrade the quality of your movie just to make it match. That's stupid. Wait, and so, my, so internal, like my internal uh, rationalization of that was that we were seeing a Wayland corporation ship that was heavily funded in Alien... We're, we're seeing a very lowly, low-funded uh, reconnaissance ship. So, of course, the equipment's going to be crappy and it's going to be gritty and dirty. This is a high-quality, this is a huge ship with a big, like, fancy surgical bay. This, this is richness. This is wealth. And the other was not. Okay, but but there but like you you don't think they could have hit an aesthetic like what you saw on Moon and and have it be? I think at it least would have been disingenuous. It would have been. It would it would have felt wrong. That's really weird to me. That's uh, I thought I I love. Like uh, wow, that's I, I feel like they created a universe and then they did something that that didn't. But the belong. universe is richer now. Now we see a different kind of ship. We see something that is long before, uh, and and maybe things have to get grittier in the future because they have to cut costs. You know, I, it didn't feel like a dissonance to me. I wasn't. It, it's so far away from that ship that I'm like, there's lots of reasons why that could be different. 
And all also, right. I wouldn't want them to be like, well, all we had was CRT monitors then, so everything has to be CRT monitors. That just seems silly. Uh, okay. Well, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's an aesthetic, and it's a consistency of the world. Like, you saw some nods to that in the Star Wars prequels, where at least they tried at the end, as they tried to, to segue into A New Hope, they at least matched the 70s aesthetic, and the costuming matched the 70s stuff. This yeah, but felt- this isn't that direct. We're not on the ship from the company that goes to Alien, and they went to great pains to explain that in all of the press leading up to this. Right, this isn't it- a direct prequel. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought I saw a scene at the end of the movie that loudly and clearly shouted, see this? It was an unnecessary scene that would serve no purpose but to loudly and stupidly shout, this movie is a direct prequel to no, Aliens. No, no, it's not. It's not a direct prequel. They said that, and just because they show a xenomorph-ish thing at the end on a different planet doesn't make it a direct prequel. It's many, many years before. Okay. Uh, wow. That's all right. Um, it's I, it's basically it's, like an episode one, but not a direct prequel. Okay. If it's not a prequel, then why does it's that? It's a sp- prequel, not a direct prequel. They're not saying we're leading right up to the things in Alien. They they okay. said this, hammered this over and over and over. Why don't you get it? <laughs> And surly beard, uh, it, it, because it was unnecessary and it and it took away from this. All right, look, let's let's get into what's wrong with this movie. Uh, you have every single character was uh, except for David. David, from beginning to end, was fascinating and interesting. If it could be, I'd have the whole movie be about him. For some reason, you have Guy Pierce playing a ninety-two-year-old man, and yet he never does anything interesting that a ninety-two-year-old man would, would that you would need a young actor wrapped up in in prosthetics. To, to do. So in, in, what you end up getting is this unnecessary impression, young actor acting like an old man that's distracting the entire movie long. You've got every single character in there. I cannot tell you the name of a single character outside of David <laughs> Waitland, which, which and that's a problem because when I saw Star Wars, I could name 12 different actors I, I, or the, the characters. I loved it. You, every character essentially marches on stage in one line, announces what their attention, in uh, what their uh, the one thing they care about is, and then they do the exact opposite of those things. They announce their motivation, and then they do the opposite. Uh, it made it was it was agonizing. There were giant chunks that uh, that made no sense. There were unintentionally hilarious moments. The 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 entire pod scene where where without anesthetic it rips open her belly, pulls out a squid, and then staple guns it shut. And then two hours later in movie time, not not in in watching the movie time, but two hours later, she's lowering a body that weighs twice her weight down the side of a, of a giant cliff like it's no big deal. You know, maybe she grunts oof a few times and that's about it. Uh, every character does the stupidest things they possibly can. If there's black alien, this is an archaeological dig. And then they walk in and they find some black goo. They stick their fingers in it. They run around taking heads of aliens. This guy travels on a trillion dollar mission, walks into a, 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 a temple, looks around, says, hey, I don't see any answers, runs off and gets drunk and starts acting racist to a robot. All of these things made absolutely no sense and they were distracting. And uh, the end result is you have characters I don't understand and I don't like and nobody grows and nothing happens here. You, It's visually a treat, but there's so much crap that just... If you want to tell people that I'm not going to let you into the ship, you don't grab a flamethrower, run down to the bay door, have them open up the bay door and shout, I'm not going to let you in. It makes no sense. You have so many people doing so many stupid things that it takes you out from anything good about what otherwise might have been a fantastic movie. And it's the uncanny valley of quality that drove me absolutely nuts watching this. So did you like it? Sorry. We couldn't hear your answer. Did you like it? It's all right. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty good. I like it too. <laughs> uh, I, where do I start? You gave all of your criticisms. I have no idea which ones to respond to. Uh, it doesn't. You you now have the conch. I've 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 blown it and I'm done. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I agree with you that uh, these characters are paper thin in most cases, and you don't care about them. I I agree with you that. Wayland didn't even need to be there. It just it felt forced. It felt like they shoved him in at the end. Uh, and I, I was talking this over with Eileen. I feel like Charlize Theron's character could have done all the things Wayland character did at the end, and that would have made Charlize's character stronger, and you would have understood her more. 
uh, because she was taking the corporate line and she was there and working with David and that would have just made a whole lot of sense. Instead, they bring Wayland in and all of a sudden she has got daddy issues that none of us knew about and, and we don't care about. And it just it, it seemed like the first half of the movie was great. Sure, there were some plot holes that you could drive a truck through, but I was willing to forgive that because of how much I liked the story and how much I was enjoying the cinematography if they had paid all of those things off and they didn't. They, they didn't pay all those things off. Uh, things like the surgical bay using staples, I, I, that doesn't bother me, whatever. I mean, I'm not expecting this to be like a true-to-life, realistic space opera. If they want to use staples to just show how gritty it is, that's fine. But pay it off with her having a hard time, not just groaning every once in a while to remind you, like, hey, I got staples in my gut. Like, make it a problem for her that she has to overcome. Don't have her lower David down the side, like you say. I mean, this is the problem. is Things, things that I'm asked to swallow, then I swallowed them for no reason. Yes. Well, and, and I'll tell you what. Think of what could have happened to the script if it was handled with more nuance and, and more affection. Like, I think about, like, if, if Joss Whedon had, had written this script, if you wanted to convey that a geologist loved rocks... You would have him say something clever or poignant or share a secret. And in that, you would understand that he's really a geologist and he's out of his field and he's a little bit intimidated and scared to be here. So he tends to bluster up in order to cover up his fear. You wouldn't have this guy loudly shout, why am I even here? I'm a geologist. I effing love rocks. Damn it. And then storm off and get lost and eaten. I don't understand why they didn't know each other either. That didn't make any yeah. sense. Like, uh, they're all introducing themselves. They didn't see each other as they were climbing into the pods. Yeah. Uh, there was also, uh, like, uh, take all the characters. They make a big deal about how there are 17 of you on this ship. And uh, uh, I'm like, oh, great. A cast of 17 characters. I wonder who we've got. Stringer well, Bell. That's awesome. We, yeah. We've got a captain who loudly announces, I love money, which is why I'm going to commit suicide in order to prevent an invasion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, and that was the other thing. Again, Charlize Theron takes Waylon's point. Well, now you need somebody to land the uh, the lifeboat because you've got the squid thing stuck in the surgical bay. So how do you have that happen? Very easily, you have the captain order the two assistants into the lifeboat. Why they stay around makes no sense. The only thing those two have done is have a stupid bet over whether it's a terraforming issue, which adds nothing to the story through the entire movie. And then when he says, you guys get out of here, they're like, nah, I will die with you. All we have is this terraforming bed anyway. There's nothing to live for. <laughs> well, it is funny because it's like they're, they for no reason all of a sudden decide to go down with the captain, go down with the ship. And it's like as they're going down, like at best, imagine that 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 I'm buying this script the to, to a T, right? And I'm all in. The best I could think as they die is they sure did never get to collect that bet. Yeah, That's, <laughs> they sure did. <laughs> uh, and there, there are definitely problems with the script, and I don't know how much to blame Damon Lindelof, how much to blame Spate, uh, because yep. it was co-written, but essentially Lindelof was brought in to clean up the script, and maybe he didn't quite get it as clean as it needed to be. Uh, there may be some problems with editing, and you alluded to that when we were talking earlier about things hitting the cutting room floor. There definitely, the, the shot the, lost me. Where I was like, I'm going to keep believing in this movie. I'm going to keep after it. I'm going to stay with it because it's. I really want this to be good, and I'm enjoying how it looks. The shot that lost me was in the captain comes into Shaw's quarters after, frankly, she just walked in on Wayland and was like, "Oh, so you're alive? Well, that's interesting." Uh, and he comes to her and says, "You've got to go with them." Why does she care what he says? They haven't had any interactions of any significance up until this point. How, how would she, he be the one that persuades her? I don't. I, I didn't get it, and that was the point where I started to go. I don't think I, I I I can believe in where this movie's going anymore. And Leo pointed out that it's at that point that that movie becomes a horror movie. Probably at the Surgical Bay, essentially, is where it becomes a horror movie. And he says that that's where they went wrong. It was a sci-fi movie for half the movie, and then it goes to be a horror movie. And I think he made a really good point there. But, but now you can navigate those waters and win. District uh, District 9 did exactly that. The first third of that movie is a mockumentary about in a science fiction world. The second third is a horror movie. And then the, the third section is a straight-up action flick. It becomes sci-fi action again. And it was brilliant. And it's like there are these three acts, each one very different. And I believed it. And I saw transformation in characters. I, care, I cared. At first, I pitied the guy. Then I cared about his plight. And then I cheered for him as it went forward. That wasn't the case at all. All I had was an obstinate 
chick looking for the answer for an ill-defined question uh, and, and it, who, who refused to – it made no sense. Here's the thing, though. I right. think in the end, you and actually Eileen were angrier at this movie than I was. Uh, and I don't know why that is, and, and that's a whole other conversation. But at the end, when Shaw does what she does at the end – I don't know why I'm being less spoilery. We're in the spoiler zone. But she takes off with David. I was like, oh, I want to find out what they, where they're going. I want to see the next movie. And, and so I liked the first half enough. And I liked the, the very, very ending of like, what's the continuing missions of David and Shaw? That I, I, I still enjoyed the movie overall. Even with its, if its glaring volcano-sized holes of, of problems. Yeah, I'll tell you what. I would have loved to see the movie start with uh, with Shaw and the head of a robot travel into some mysterious, uh, you know, location and and uh, go from there. You know, maybe flashbacks to how we got here. I, I I don't know. There's a million things that could have been better. But all right, we got to wrap up. Home Theater Geeks is coming up next. Uh, thanks everybody for watching the Spoiler Zone. Twit.tv/fr. We'll see you later.